questions? Okay, so today is um, May the 8th something, of uh, 2015, and we have Bill Pierce here and Ian. So we have Granddad here and Ian and Jack and PJ. And we're going to talk about, and this is in Austin in, at home, and so Bill is here visiting on his uh after his 90th birthday, and um, we're talking tonight about his history. So, so anyway, start. So, so Dad was born in 1925, January 23rd, 1925, in Perryton. And, and you've never been to Perryton. You probably don't have any idea where it is, but it's, it's up by Booker, which is... Uh, North of Amarillo and pretty close to the Oklahoma line, right there. Yeah. So, um, anyway, um, his his father William Nelson Pierce Sr. and his mother was Thelma Pierce. Also, Thelma. Um, uh, Do it. No. Huff. 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 I had to go through the I had to go through the circulation here. <laughs> Uh, Thelma Huff and um, dad's dad died in 1947 or 8 7 1947 and grandma died in 1997 correct? yeah yeah at 97 at age 97 okay so anyway so the bo the bottom line is um, so that's that's where it all starts um, so my understanding is then um, you guys were in Puritan because why were you in Puritan, Dad? Dad worked there for the railroad. Right, for the Santa Fe Railroad um, back then. And he'd been working there, and we're not sure exactly how long he'd been working for the railroad at that time, right? Because you and I tried to look that up yesterday and couldn't really figure it out. No, we couldn't figure out even how he started working for the railroad at when... Mother and he met at Hereford. Right, and they were married in Hereford too, right? I think so, yeah. yeah. And Hereford's up by Amarillo too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, so anyways, working on the railroad there, and then you went from there to uh, where to Bovina? No. You Where'd mean you go? From Perryton? Yeah, from Perryton, where did you go? Well, I think the next place was probably Mendota. Mendota is between Miami and Canadian. Oh, really? And from there he went to, I think he spent some time in Miami. Which is about two, an hour and a half from Amarillo or something like that. Probably, because Canadian is about two hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't remember how he mound up in Bovina and when it was. But... Uh, we lived at Bovina 10 years, and uh, at the age of four or five, I used to run off from home, and my mother, to counteract that, either tied me to the clothesline or put a dress on me. <laughs> and when she had the dress on me, I wouldn't stray out of the yard. <laughs> And I started to school when I was five years old. And I think the reason I did that is because they wanted to know where I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so naturally then I graduated when I was 16 years old out of high school. Why but, do you think you wanted to wander so much? Well, it wasn't wandering. You just wanted I to wanted go play with to the play kids. with other kids. Yeah. And Were there so, other kids around? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of my uh, friends lived right across the street from where we lived, and that street was a main highway at that time. <laughs> and I'm sure they were concerned about me crossing that highway. Yeah. But the dress kept me at home pretty much. <laughs> well, was that a, did you hate that? Was it humiliating? Do you remember? I don't remember the, anything about that. I was told later, it, you know, it happened. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, I went through 
school there until I was about 13. No, let me back up. Let's see, 1933, I'd have been about eight years old, eight or nine. And uh, Dad decided one day that he wanted to wash down the walls in the depot at Bovina. So he took a straight ladder, put it up against the wall, and <coughs> the depot had wooden floors. So he nailed the ladder to the floor. And he goes up the ladder. Naturally, we know what happened. The nails came loose. The ladder slid down the wall. He run his leg through and doubled it back under one of those rungs. And it all but cut his foot off on his leg. Well, he was out of work 18 months. And uh, he wanted to go back to work, naturally. So the company allowed him to go back to work if he could trade jobs with somebody on a branch line where the trains didn't run constantly like they did on the main line at Bohena. So he got the chance to trade places with the agent at Raiden, Oklahoma. So we moved over there then, and uh, at that time Oklahoma had 12 grades, so they moved me up one grade, and we lived there until 1938. So they moved you up a grade older than what you were? Yeah, let's say, so I was, smart. let's say I was in sixth grade, or whatever. Yeah. Sixth grade in Texas, but when I go to Oklahoma, I move up to seventh grade because they've got 12 grades. So essentially, I'm in the same area. Mm -hmm. But in 1938, then, we moved to Booker. Well, and I graduated from high school in 1941, three years later. And uh, I was too young then to get a job at 16, so I worked as a soda jerk in a drugstore, and I worked in a filling station. It sounds to me as if you... Skipped ahead two grades, probably. No, just one, just because one. Texas had 11. All right. Oklahoma had 12. But and when I came back to Booker, okay. when I came back to Booker, they moved me back a grade. Because, let's say I was in a sophomore, mm -hmm. you know, I'd have been a freshman. But anyway, I mean, I'd been a still sophomore, but I'd have been in 11th grade. And... Uh, well, well, okay, but before you go any further, tell us a little bit about what you did in high school. Well. And what sports did you play? And I played Were you tennis, in the theater and so on? Tennis, basketball, football. You were the quarterback in football, right? Yeah. Six man? Yeah, six man football, but I only weighed about 125, 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. And, did, you get, uh, did you get knocked around, or uh, were you the smallest kid? I was the smallest one on the team. Mm -hmm. Had leather helmets too, right? Yeah. But they didn't allow you to, in six-man football, the way I remember it, they didn't allow you to tackle a quarterback. But the quarterback? I yeah. tried to tackle a running back one day and got kicked in the chin with his foot. So when I went in the Marine Corps, eventually I had that cause an abscess and had to have a tooth pulled, but that's beside the point right <laughs> now. And uh, I made good grades in high school, in school. I can't remember, I wasn't a straight A student of course, but... Uh, what was your favorite subject? My favorite subject? Mm -hmm. Probably shop, woodwork. Oh yeah? And uh, I hated al I hated algebra because I didn't understand it. Were you good in uh, English class? Uh, I'd say normal. Yeah. So were you better on the on the social studies English side or the math side? I think uh, until we got into algebra, mm -hmm. the yeah. math side. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had algebra and trigonometry, both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, I made passing grades on both of them, but I didn't 
excel, so to speak. Okay, and so you were what the shortstop in baseball? Uh, shortstop in baseball. And basketball. What did you, you tell the story about the basketball? And he had a, a court that they played, right? Well, we didn't have a gym, didn't have a gymnasium at the time, and there was a vacant building on Main Street there that at one time had been, oh, I think where they sold machinery, but it had a concrete floor, and it had a, a roof that was, uh, what do you call that, when it's oval, so to speak? Mm -hmm. Well, it had steel rafters, Convex, I guess. and they, of course, to hold the roof up, they were oval like this, then they were straight across for support, and they had cross members like that. If you wanted to shoot a long shot, which I couldn't do, but some of the boys could, you had to shoot through mm -hmm. the rafters in order to get it high enough to get to the goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course we played with tennis shoes, but uh, uh, that was an experience. We eventually got a gymnasium after I was gone. Bill, let me ask you, uh, you grew up, you know, during the Depression. Were y'all poor or what? Well, Dad had a job, so I can't say we were poor. Yeah. I have no idea what his salary was at okay. the time, of course, but I don't recall ever wanting for anything. Okay. And, but, and uh, the other thing about the Depression was that... Uh, one set of grandparents came to live with you for a while, right? For a while, yeah. That was my mother's folks, uh, Reese and Tilly Huff. They lived with us for a while. And, uh, oh, see, one thing, <laughs> while we lived there at Bovina, we had a post office robbery. And, one of the guys came, well, we had a fence clear around our property, but it was just a wooden fence. And this was during the snow, winter time. But we saw where one of them jumped over the fence, went around through the yard, and then jumped over it again, and hid in a culvert that ran underneath the railroad tracks. And the townspeople rooted him out, <laughs> and uh, they got caught him. But that's really beside the point. I just happen to think of that mm -hmm. as we go along. Yeah. Was that exciting for you as a kid? I didn't know anything about it until they told me. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course I wasn't old enough at the time to really, well I was about like Brooks' mm -hmm. age, you know, at the time. Mm -hmm. But of course I knew about it. So you were also, though, in in high school, you were in the one-act play or whatever it was, too, and you won yeah, the... Yeah, uh, that's one thing that I excelled in. I We had a one-act play contest in the county, mm -hmm. and I had the lead in our play, and the play, I think the name was probably Wildcat Willie. And I don't know if they chose me because my name was William or not. But anyway, in the play, I was trying on a dress for my mother <laughs> that she had made for my sister. And some of my friends came in, boyfriend. And I remember I had to talk in a high voice and play like I was a girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway... I won first place in the county for those one-act plays. And of course, we had Higgins, Darazeth, Lipscomb, Booker. Mm, that may be all of them. I don't remember now. <laughs> but I won first place in that one-act play contest. Wow. <laughs> and I got a trophy. <laughs> don't ever know what happened to it. <laughs> but when I got out of high school, like I said, I worked in a drugstore and so forth. At 17 then, I hired out with the railroad, and I started my railroad career at Canyon, Texas, as an apprentice operator. So 
So I was sort of a help man with the agents there, so to speak. And I wanted to learn telegraph, so I vacancy came up at Periton, and I talked them in to let me transfer to Periton, which is 15 miles from Booker, where my dad was an agent. And that way, he and I could work back and forth on telegraph, and I learned telegraph. So your dad him. knew telegraph already? Oh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. they had to. Because all the uh, telegrams that came in came telegraph. Is the Morse code, does that figure into that or no? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So you know the Morse code, or you did? Well, I did. Mm hmm And then, of course, when I went in the Marine Corps, that's how I wound up as a radio operator, because okay. I knew that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was working in Amarillo uh, after Perryton. I was moved to Amarillo, went to work there, and then... When I turned 18 in January of uh, 43, I knew I was going to be drafted. And I didn't want to go into the Army. And I thought about the Navy, but I decided to go join the Marine Corps. So I joined the Marine Corps in Amarillo. But I had to go to El Paso to be sworn in and take a physical. And then I was shipped to San Diego. And so do you remember when exactly what that was to San Diego? Because, I mean, you turned 18 in January. I think it was March, March. when I enlisted. When you enlisted. Okay. Yeah. We might be able to find that online. I don't know. Uh, I couldn't swear to that, but uh, it seemed like that's when it was. Okay. And, once and how old were you? 18. 18. 18, okay. 18. And I went to San Diego, and boot camp, I had to spend, I think, uh, what was it, five weeks? I don't remember how long boot camp was. But after I completed boot camp... Well, talk about boot camp. Was that bad? Not to me it wasn't. Uh, there was a lot of so-called mama boys <laughs> that couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, they talked to you like you wasn't a human. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to shave every day. As a matter of fact, I didn't have that many whiskers at 18. And one day we went out for uh, our usual e exam, inspection. And he looked at me and he said, did you shave this morning? And I said, no. Well, you come to my tent at noon and bring your razor. Yeah. Which I did. And there was, I think, three or four men lived in the same tent. They were all uh, instructors. And I had to dry shave in front of those guys <laughs> at noon. Well, after boot camp then, they sent me to radio school, which was in the same place. So I learned radio communication. Then they sent me to uh, Camp Pendleton which was primarily, we'll say, for infantry. But the idea was they had an uh, instructor there that would show you how to carry a portable radio and work with the so-called infantry men. And then I went from there to Camp Elliott, which was rifle range, and we had to spend, I think it was two weeks at the rifle range firing rifle. And like I told your dad, we were shooting at all kinds of targets, but eventually we had to shoot at a 500 yard target. And that's quite a distance. And you, you, got, you were an expert marksman or something, right? Yeah. yeah. 
And uh, after I completed that then... So you did well with that? Yeah, I did well with the rifle mm -hmm. shooting. After that, they sent me, I can't remember the name of the place, but it was in San Diego or close by, Tank Farm, where they had uh, tanks. I had to learn to drive a tank. I thought, well, I'm going to go overseas then as a tank driver and radio operator and all that stuff. And believe it or not, when they sent me overseas, they put me back in the so-called infantry carrying a radio on my back. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had a lot of experience in the Marine Corps as far as training. I had a lot of different areas that I was trained in. And uh, before we go overseas, what else you want to know? Was all that training in California? Mm-hmm. All in San Diego. San Diego and of course Camp Pendleton, I mean Camp Elliott, is where uh, one of the golf courses is now. Oh, the... Uh, at, it, at that time it yeah. was a uh, parking area for, you know, rest area. Mm -hmm. And then they later turned it into a golf course. Yeah. What's the name of that place? Oh, the, 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 Ian, the one they play every year Pebble out there. Beach? No, it's further down. The one that Tiger liked a lot. I can't remember. I can't think of it right now either. So. Torrey Pines. Torrey Pines. Torrey Pines. Torrey Pines. It was a golf course. Yeah. At that time it was Torrey Pines, but it was a rest area. Mm -hmm. You know, for people traveling on the highway. Yeah. And uh, So then you received your orders to go overseas. Yeah. And, and, and when was it that that you went? That was in... Well, it was uh, Christmas Day of 1943, yeah. Yeah. and we shipped out from San Francisco. So, okay. did you know the whole time that you were going to go Pacific, or? Yeah, yeah, because at that time, they I don't think they were even sending anybody the other way, because mm. all the fighting was going on in the Pacific with the Japs. The Army was taking care of you know, the German side of it. So all the Marines went to the Pacific? Yeah, at that time. Okay. Of course, now they they go everywhere, I guess. But uh, yeah. at that time, we shipped out from San Francisco, went to Honolulu, and from there down to Oahu, which is another one of the islands. Mm -hmm. And uh, we stayed there until... When did you say, June? June 15th. June 15th. And that's when we invaded Saipan. Were you involved in that? Yeah. So tell, tell a little bit about the first day going on shore at Saipan. Well, Saipan had a... Uh, Coral well, reef. <laughs> reef. I couldn't think of the word. Had a reef around it. And so Higgins boats, I don't know if you've ever seen a Higgins boat or not. They're a wide open boat. You've got one guy running the controls and them, you know, the rudder and all that. But it's completely open and all the Marines can ride in there as a group. But the Higgins boats could not go over that reef because they were, it was too high and the boats were dragged on the rock trying to go over it. So we would go part way in a Higgins boat and got from there then into what they called amphibious tractors. And that was nothing more than a boat that had treads on it like a caterpillar. More like a tank. Yeah, like a tank. And when it got to the reef, of course, then it could climb up on the reef because of those treads. Those. Mm. And was then your we, father still alive while you were mm. over there? Your dad was still alive, oh, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't die till after I got back home. Oh, okay. Yeah, Higgins boats uh, would carry how many men, Dad? 
Oh, I'd say, I'd just guess, but I'd say at least 20. Yeah, no, it was pretty big, but it wasn't real big. Yeah, and the front of it drops down. Uh, a lot of times they would carry, for instance, a Jeep mm -hmm. off of a ship and uh, put it in a Higgins boat, take it ashore, drop the front end down and drive the Jeep out. So it was sort of a truck, we'll say, yeah. to haul things. And uh, so that's why, though, we had to ride the amphibious tractors because of the coral reef around that island. And we went ashore. So were you in the first wave, the second wave, the third wave? How did that work? Well, it wasn't the first wave because the first wave that went in was all primarily, I keep calling them infantry for lack of a better word, but they were all uh, Marines that carried nothing but a rifle, you know. And so they went in and the Japs were trying to keep them off the beach with shell fire and so forth. I, I would say we were probably in all oh, six or eight behind them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went ashore and, of course, dug in. And the first night I remember being ashore, I, of course, I had a foxhole dug behind a tree. <laughs> and the first night ashore, the Japanese tanks and soldiers threw a counterattack into us. And I mean, the bullets were whizzing by me on both sides, but I was behind the tree and in the foxhole, obviously as low as I could get. But I was on the radio. I had to be on the radio to keep contact with uh, different ones. But they finally fought them off, and the next morning there were a lot of burnout Japanese tanks and a lot of dead soldiers laying around. Dead Americans and Japanese? Yeah, both. Well, were you shooting or were you doing the radio? No, I wasn't doing any shooting at that time. Were you scared? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you could imagine an 18 year old kid like that, or any age, mm -hmm. being out there and having bullets flying around, knowing what was happening, but not knowing what the finish was going to be. Were people in the foxhole getting killed? There wasn't anybody in there with me. Mm. I was by myself. The rest of them, I'm sure, had foxholes, and there was dead shoulder, soldiers that would, you know, raise up and <laughs> thinking about that. It reminds me of a time that me and another guy was in a foxhole and it was raining, and we had put a a tarp over the foxhole to keep the rain off of us and we were laying there just nice and cozy and this is at night and all of a sudden there was a shadow come up over this foxhole and you're laying there looking like this and you see that shadow well you don't know what it is so the guy that was with me shot it turned out it was a cow <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I stuck his head down in there, in that foxhole, looking to see what was going on. I guess, but uh, so there were a lot. It was a lot of sugar cane and stuff there on the island there on the yeah, just off the beach. Yeah, Saipan right? and Tinian both raised a lot of sugar cane, and there was a town on Saipan called Garapan, and there was a number of civilians lived there, men, women, and children. And you probably read about the women, or the Japs entirely, I guess, had been told how mean the Marines were. And eventually, the women migrated north on the island with their kids, and to keep us from capturing them, they threw the kids off the cliffs into the rocks and water below, and then they jumped in after them committed suicide. We tried to stop them, but we couldn't. So after the first day, then, so first day, you, so you just kept moving on? Yeah, it was just the constant movement after that. And eventually, of course, 
they all retreated to the north end of the island, and uh, we followed them up. Of course, there was a mountain top of Chaw on there that we had to go around. There was another uh, Marine unit that followed in behind us, and they took one side of the island, we took the other side of the island. And uh, the Japs were, some of them, in caves up on this mountain. That was the first time I was telling your dad that I saw throwing grenades and Molotov. Molotov cocktails in there, and they would surrender and come out. So, so Dad, where, do you know exactly where you landed on the island of Saipan? Do you because was it close to Garapan or was it? Well, it was. Or more toward the air, the the base or the um, runway. It was closer to the town. Okay. But I don't remember exactly yeah. where. Okay. And so when they surrendered, when the Japanese surrendered, what would, where would they go? Well, they took them into a, uh, they made a prison camp there on the island. The Americans did? Yeah. Okay. But the majority, what happened to the majority of the Japanese? Most of them got killed. Yeah. Most of them died. They, they, yeah. they did. Uh, well, did uh, they commit suicide? Is what well, they, they charged, right, Dad? Then they charged the lines and they just went down and they shot them. But he was saying that they took a lot of, they took some prisoners. They took some prisoners, some, but, but the, the Japanese uh, were tricky. Uh, you couldn't trust them, of course. And some of them would come up that, out with their hands up out of those caves, for instance but be carrying a weapon, say, in their back, mm. and they'd get out and jerk it. Well, then they shot them mm. whenever they resisted in any kind of a capture. So were you using a gun at that point, or were no. you doing all the radio? Radio. Just, okay. My job primarily, all the time I was on the island except uh, one time, was to keep in contact with headquarters on the radio so that the commander of the, say, the colonel or whatever he was, of the men that were going with him had a way of contacting headquarters in case they wanted to change any information or whatever. So my job was to stay with him so he had access to the radio all the time and could talk to headquarters. And you were the only radio operator, so you were very important. Yeah, I was the only one with that group. Of course, they had other ones mm -hmm. with other groups. Mm -hmm. I was telling Jack that <laughs> one time we were going down through a cane field and I had a colonel that was, wasn't afraid of the devil himself. And we started getting uh, artillery fire off a hill up there ahead of us. Well, as soon as they fired the first shot, I was on the ground. But not the colonel. He stood up and looked around to see what was going on. He said, get a hold of headquarters for me. And I gave him the radio and he told him to call in airstrikes and artillery and whatever, you know. I don't know if that guy ever got killed, but he sure scared me to death because he wasn't afraid to go anywhere or do anything. And I had to be with him. And so you don't remember exactly how long you were on um, Saipan, do you? No, it's been too long ago now. I don't remember how long. But it was quite a while because um, you went from there to... Tinian. To Tinian. And Tinian started on the, um, the 25th of July. And we landed on Saipan June, June the 15th. 15th. Yeah. So see, it was over a month yep. before we... And the reason we invaded Tinian was because they wanted that airfield. There was an airfield there, and they wanted that for the B-29s so they could bomb Tokyo and Japan. And, uh, of course, eventually that's why they took Iwo Jima, too, because they wanted the airfield closer. Bill, were you aware? I just finished reading Unbroken while that, and... Um were you aware that the American POWs were being treated so horribly in Japan? 
No. At the time. Not at the time. Okay. Uh, and in fact, uh, see, most of those were taken in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. That is, the prisoners were. Mm -hmm. And they were transported to either Japan or had prison camps in the Philippine Islands. But we didn't know anything about that until I guess I read about it later. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've seen movies, of course, mm -hmm. that they've made along that line. But uh, after Tinian then... Well, tell us a little bit about Tinian. What was that like? Well, it wasn't as uh, bad as Saipan because there wasn't as many Japanese troops on there. And it was the same old, same old for me, just to go in carrying a radio and be with an officer that was in charge of the troops wherever they might be. And I don't even remember now how long we were there. You looked it up. Yeah, it... Um, was it nine days? The, the battle, it was nine days, right, exactly. It took nine days to take Tinian. And, it, you know, it, trying my memory, I, it doesn't even seem like it was that long. Mm -hmm. Because it's such a short time compared to Saipan. And we didn't even know why at the time, we didn't even know why it was important enough that we take the darn place. Yeah, it was there was because of the, I think it's called Usaya uh, Air Dome, which was the... the so uh, eventually that's where the uh, bombs in Japan came from, was off that island. Mm -hmm. oh. They were making the bombs there. No, no, that's where the planes that's took where off. The planes were they carried you know, the bombs? Had, okay. They only had a certain distance that they could go, and mm -hmm. so the Enola Gay, which dropped the first atomic bomb, took off from Tinian. Later on, a B twenty nine, right, Dad? And then later on, they took uh, Iwo Jima, which made it even closer mm -hmm. to Japan. And uh, but you weren't you you guys you weren't ever on Iwo Jima yourself. No. Right. No, I listened to it on the radio because with it, having a radio like that, we could hear the communication up there that was going on, you know, with the troops that were involved. What did you hear about Iwo Jima? Do you remember when you were listening on the radio? Well, no, it was all typically military in conversations, you know, about you need to move somebody here and you need to bring up the tanks or you need to use artillery or whatever. So we just heard what they were talking about each other in the fight. But we didn't know anything about it as far as what was actually happening. Mm -hmm. So after you, if you were on Tinian, you went back to Saipan, Saipan. right? Uh, but you were part of... And Iwo Jima, you were kind of backup for Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima, right? No. You weren't? Okinawa. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okinawa. And After then, Iwo Jima, then, they decided to invade Okinawa. But it was not our Marine Division that was going to do it. I think it was 4th Division, 4th mm -hmm. Marines. Yeah. And we went up there aboard ship just as backup in case they needed us. Now, that's where... All the kamikaze got started. These Japanese would fly their planes into the ships trying to sink them or blow them up. And uh, I was telling Jack, a friend of mine was on one of the ships. That, uh, he was not in our division, but later on I knew him on the railroad. And he told me that he was on a ship one time and saw that they saw this plane coming in, flying low over the ocean, knowing that it was coming to their ship. Everybody rushed over to that side of the ship to see what was going on, which was a dumb thing to do. And he dove right into the mess hall, and of course a lot of these guys got knocked over the rail in with the explosion, and some of them got killed, I'm sure. He was lucky enough he wasn't, but he was on the ship. But we went up there and they found out they didn't need us, so then we came back to Saipan again. That was I our... Mean, you were in your, in your platoon or whatever they call it, in your troop division. division. Well, I don't remember for sure, 
what a division had, but it seemed like it was about 15,000. But did you have a small group that you belonged to? We well, did. Yeah, I was in, so you got the 2nd Marine Division, then you got different company, or yes. different, uh, you got first, 2nd Marines, 4th Marines, 6th Marines, 10th Marines was an artillery outfit oh. in the division, so you had different units like that. And uh, I was in headquarters company. All the radio operators was in headquarters company. Yeah. And then when they needed us, they just picked us out and said, you go here and you go there. Do you feel like you were pretty lucky to have uh, been able to be a radio operator? Yeah, yeah. Because it might have saved to, your life. I didn't have to go to the front line, so to speak, all the time like the rest of them did you know, did because they were riflemen. Mm -hmm. And uh, we eventually, let's see, we've been to Okinawa, we came back to Saipan, and then we stayed there until they dropped the atomic bomb. Well, both of them, first one Hiroshima and then second one Nagasaki. Then we were shipped to Nagasaki and we don't remember now, do we, how long it was? No, we talked about that. You've told me that there maybe it was 10 days or so, but then you're not sure either about how long it was. I think it's probably longer than that. Maybe a month after the bomb. But, you know, as much as they talked about radiation from bombs like that, well, you know that when we went to Nagasaki, there had to be a lot of radiation there. Mm -hmm because it looked like if you ever saw a town that had been wiped out with a tornado here, that's what it looked like when in Nagasaki. The houses and everything was destroyed. The trees and shrubs on the hillsides were all burned off. The only, about the only thing left was a, what had been a naval station down on the shore, and I don't know how that ever survived. But that's where we stayed, uh, you know, for our uh, bunks. The Japs had, that was uh, one of their bases? Yeah, that was Japanese yeah. buildings that had been part of their naval bases. Mm. I got acquainted with a Japanese young lady that had been raised and went to college in the United States and could speak English. Obviously, I couldn't speak Japanese. Mm. And she told me, you know, how terrible things were when they dropped the atomic bomb and all that stuff. And I stayed there then at Nagasaki. And I, at that time then, I got a Jeep that had a radio in it. And an officer went with me or I went with him anyway, you want to look at it. We drove around over Japan looking for ammunition dumps. And when we found a Japanese ammunition dump, we radioed headquarters. Then they would send out trucks to pick up this ammunition and go dump it in the ocean. So that's what we were doing in Japan. It's what I was doing. And I don't remember now how long we stayed there. You but, never ran across any POW camps though, right? Mm -mm. Okay. No. And when we, and at that time everybody was earning points. You had to have so many points to get to go home. And you got so many points for, uh, well, we'll say invasions and things like that, you know. And eventually I got enough points to go home along with a bunch of other guys. And we boarded a train at uh, Nagasaki and went up to a place called Sasebo. That's where we had to go to get aboard ship, to go home. So we started home from Sasebo. Now Jack asked me the other day, did we stop in Hawaii? And I don't remember if we went directly. It seemed like we went directly back to San Diego. But anyway, when we left Japan, 
we got into a typhoon and that lasted about three days. And I was telling him how funny it was that the first day I went down to the mess hall to eat on the ship in this storm that was tossing us around, I stepped in the mess hall and just as I did, I saw a guy that had his tray and had started across to a table. And about that time, the ship rolled in the direction he was going. Of course, that made it downhill. <laughs> and what I didn't know and learned then was that a lot of guys evidently had done that and they were serving spaghetti that night and they spilled it all over that steel floor and when that ship rolled like that and he was carrying his tray, his feet went out from under him when he hit the wall and spaghetti went everywhere. <laughs> and uh, we ate sandwiches <laughs> for two days after that. <laughs> Let me ask you, before you left Japan, after the bombs had been dropped and so Japan had surrendered, did you... Uh, and you were still in Nagasaki uh, and then the other place before you left. Um, did you see many of the uh, Japanese civilians? Uh, quite a few. In fact, we stayed one night when I was out looking for the ammunition. We stayed in a Japanese hotel, spent the night. Mm -hmm. And I told Jack when we walked in the room, there wasn't anything in there. And I said, where's the bed, <laughs> you know? Well, it's in the closet. So we opened the sliding doors and there was a cotton mattress you put on the floor. And I know you've seen these rolls about like that that they use for pillows. They were about mm -hmm. that big around and that's not very comfortable to try to sleep on. Mm -hmm. But we slept in the Japanese hotel so we were in a town with Japanese uh, civilians. So what were the civilians acting like after after the surrender? Well, surprisingly, and I don't know whether it was out of fear or what, but it seemed like they were friendly toward us. Really? Of course, you know, we were not threatening in any way because it's just the driver and the officer and me in this Jeep. And so we weren't a threat to them in any way, and they seemed to be very polite mm -hmm. and nice to us. Now, I'm sure that if we'd been carrying rifles and, you know, walking down the street or whatever, it'd been a little different. Mm -hmm. Of course, we all carried sidearms, but uh, I don't remember them being in any way a problem as far as we were concerned. Well, after the surrender, where did the soldiers go? The Japanese soldiers? Well, I don't really know what happened there. You didn't see any of them around? Not, not really. Yeah. I'm sure that they must have been in camps somewhere, but uh, I don't really know what took place there. But we didn't really come in contact with them. So how long were you there total from, what was it, Saipan was, you said... In Japan? Yeah. So it was, what was it, July? 44? Uh, June? It was June, was June 15th of 44 was well, that Saipan. that was Saipan. Right. And the bomb, so, but, I mean, the bomb was not actually dropped until... August. 45. Uh, August of 45. And it's so... A year and two months, basically. And then, but when you got back to San Diego was, and you finally got discharged from San Diego. I was discharged January 1st of 46. 46. What was how many? Well, I mean, from... Year and a half? About, you know... 43, well, 43 oh, to 46. Yeah. 43 to 46, he was in the Army. Yeah. So about three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the uh, funny part of that was in San Diego, after we got back to San Diego, they called all of us down one day to a meeting that had points that you could be discharged or whatever. 
I don't know how many guys were there, but I'd say at least 50 in this building. And this officer was talking to us, you know, about the, how good an outfit the Marine Corps was and blah, 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 blah. And he says, now, I know a lot of you guys want to go home, but any of you that want to re-enlist and stay in the Corps are welcome to do so, you know. So the ones that want to stay can stay here and I'll help you get things settled. The rest of you can go back to barracks. There wasn't a soul stayed, everybody <laughs> left. <laughs> and, and what I know, Bill, is that you never wanted to go abroad again your whole, the rest of your life. Well, <laughs> uh, of course, we haven't. We've been to Hawaii, which, yeah. you know, is the only time. But I told everybody, I said, at some time during that conflict, I don't remember when it was, I probably made a promise to God that if I got home safe, I'd never leave again. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, you got home, and you ended up in Winoka, right? Well, eventually, I don't remember just when, I went back to work for the railroad. Mm -hmm. And the way the railroad worked, if you had seniority over somebody, you could take their job and they could take somebody else, and what they call bump somebody. Mm -hmm. So I had a choice of going, I forget now where it was, other or that, than uh, Winoka, and of course I didn't know anything about Winoka. But that's where I went with Winoka. Did you bump somebody? Yeah. Uh-huh. Because you had a little bit of seniority? I had seniority because all the time that I was in the service counted okay. on your seniority too. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I went, met uh, his mother, your grandmother. And uh, she was working for the railroad, too. And then we got married, oh, what is it, October, I think. 46, uh, 46. 46. How old were you? Well, I would have been... Uh, 21. What, 21. And how old was she? Probably 21. She was I would born. have been. I don't remember. When was her birthday? Her birthday April, was, wasn't it? No, July. July 22nd. Uh, oh. Yeah, Courtney's. Courtney's birthday. Birthday. But what year? Uh, 26. Mm -hmm. So she was a year, a year younger than you. A year and a half younger than yeah, you. Yeah, I didn't remember exactly then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's sort of the general story of my life. Well, so, and how long did you stay in Winoka? You had, he was born in Winoka. Charlie was born in Winoka, I think. No, no. Uh, Amarillo. He was born in Amarillo. That's right, because you were 18 months old? When no, I was 11 months old. We, we lived in Winoka five years. Okay. Wasn't that, that'd be about, about right. right. Yeah. We moved in, in, my understanding is we moved 51. to Amarillo in June of 51. And your dad died in when? 47, I think it was. Okay, so a couple of years after you got home, yeah. or a year, maybe? Mm -hmm. Might have been... Might have been 48. I don't remember. What did he die of? Well, he died of a heart attack, but that was brought on by that broken leg mm -hmm. that I talked about. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, they didn't put his leg in the cast that I remember. They put it in a box mm -hmm. and wrapped this box with, we'll say, tape. Or, mm -hmm. Anyway, it kept it solid from moving, you know. But... Well, the only thing that kept his foot onto his leg when he broke it that time, or cut it off, you might say, was this skin. He just all but cut it off. But you can imagine a round uh, rung on a tra uh, ladder going through there and left a lot of bone fragments. And they eventually, over a period of time, worked out, you know. And... Uh, he had a lot of trouble with that for a number of years, and eventually 
it formed a blood clot that went to his heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what killed him, but it was a result of that broken leg. Mm -hmm. Of course, the broken leg took place, we'll say, about 1933, maybe, somewhere along there. So it was about 14 years later, you know, mm -hmm. that he Painful years lived with it, but yeah. uh, mm -hmm. he eventually died of a heart attack because of a blood clot. Mm -hmm. So we lived in the house that you saw, you've seen. In you, Tom Lipscomb. Or, no, no, well, I'm talking about in Winoka. Yeah, yeah. We lived in the house that was across from the Methodist Church and across from the school. Mm -hmm. And they bought that when they got married. And that's where I was, um, that's where we lived. I was born there at the E.P. Clapper Memorial Hospital. <laughs> on Election Day. On Election Day mm -hmm. in, in Winoka. Must have been on a Tuesday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, then we moved to the, the house on Lipscomb, 4104 Lipscomb. And What do you remember about that house, Bill, on Lipscomb? Uh, do you remember how much it cost to buy? $10,000. Mm -hmm. Did y'all pay cash, or how did you buy that? Uh, her folks loaned us the money or gave us the money. I don't <coughs> remember now whether it was we paid it back or not. I just don't remember. But that's how we bought it was because of her folks. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing I remember about that the house had fallen through the ceiling in the garage. What were you doing up there? I don't know what I was doing up in the attic. I don't remember, mm -hmm. but I stepped mm -hmm. off one of those two or fours up there and my foot went through that sheetrock and thank goodness it was a garage. Well, yeah, but you didn't fall into the No, garage. I didn't fall. Yeah, I just just run my legs through. Yeah. Yeah. Just went through yeah. the sheet rut. Right. Then we built oh, a house later in 58 that we eventually lived in. Over on Doris? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In 58. So y'all lived there about <clears throat> seven years. 10 years. Oh, seven years? Seven years in, on Lipscomb. Yeah, but then in on the Doris house. Well, right there, it was 12 years then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, and you were working in the Santa Fe building. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. He was a dispatcher back then, right? And yeah. he, had, he had really weird hours. You worked third shift most of the time. Did you all the time? At night. For about 20 years. Yeah, a long time. <laughs> and that was from 7 to 7 or what? Mm. No, no, 11 to 7. 11 to 7, 7, yeah. And that's why I took the, well, I took the transfer to Chicago because it was a day job, plus the fact it was a new department and something they were starting up new, and so they were using dispatchers to go up there and control all the locomotives over the system. And that was in what year, Dad? Uh, 1970, wasn't it? No. That yeah, would have been, we were there five years, of about by 65. No. 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 Y'all got, got married June no. 2nd of 1970. Yeah. Yeah, it was in 70. Yeah, in 70. <laughs> and we left there for 75, went back to Clovis then. Mm -hmm. And then when I retired in Clovis, we came back to Amarillo. Right, but you had you so so your job in Chicago was as a what we call, you called a power distributor. I think that's yeah. the way I remember it. Yeah. yeah. Well, what what had happened over the years? See, each uh, division they had control over the, the, any locomotives that they had there. They could run them any way they wanted to. Well, so you got a division here, say it's got five of them sitting idle, and you got a division over here that doesn't have any but needs to make a train. So they sent us up there with the idea that we made a point to find out who needed what where, and so if, if a guy in Amarillo had five engines and somebody in Clovis, for instance, needed to mail a train didn't have one, then we could run a double header 
two or three engines on a train to Clovis, and they cut off what they needed. Mm -hmm. So that's what it was for, power distributor. And you went back to Clovis five years later, and what, what was your job in Clovis? I was a rules examiner. I had to, every year, I had to go from Clovis to Carlsbad to El Paso to... Uh, <laughs> Can't even think of them right now. Another place, Belen, New Mexico, and Albuquerque. And all the engineers, conductors, and brakemen had to come in every year and get a test on the rules. So I would spend, say, from 8 o'clock until noon going over the rules, explaining the rules, and so forth. We break for lunch, then they come back and take a written test. And if they didn't pass it, they had to come back and take it again. Well, you know, sometimes you'd have eight or ten guys in a class, and the next time you might have 50 or 60. <laughs> You wanted at one point to be a high school teacher, I think, didn't you? Because you went back to college. No, I was going to be a pharmacist. pharmacist. Yeah. Pharmacist. Okay. So you were in. You went to AC, or where did you go? I went to AC and got a degree there, mm -hmm. and started down at uh, West Texas, mm -hmm. and then she got sick with uh, breast cancer, and I eventually had to quit didn't get to finish down at WT. Mm -hmm. We had, I'll never forget this as long as I live, had to take a course in uh, physics. Yeah, physics. I couldn't think of it. I was going to say it. But right. our instructor had been, uh, well, I don't know what he was exactly, but he was with a NASA in, uh, aerial outfit down at Houston and he had come up to WT as a physics instructor <laughs> and I never will forget that he talked about things out in space you know and blah 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 but I remember the first test that the class took under him after he had explained all that junk to us I think the tie, highest grade was 29 or something like that. <laughs> he was too smart mm -hmm. to be an instructor. He didn't know how to explain things to other people. And you were kind of old uh, to be, uh, I mean, you were one of the oldest persons in the class, I would assume. Yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. it was mostly uh, college-age kids. And I remember being in an Amarillo uh, college. I'd never had chemistry at all in high school. I didn't even know what a beaker was. Mm. But I was lucky enough that in chemistry lab, the, of course, the instruction wasn't a problem, but in the lab work. And I had a young man and a young lady that were just out of high school on either side of me in the lab, and they had both had chemistry, mm. and they were both good at it. And they kept me going. Did they teach you stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like nice. I say, I didn't even want a beaker was. <laughs> so if something came up, well, get this and do this and what have you, they helped me. I couldn't do chemistry what very well because it involves so much math. Did you uh, have trouble with the math or not? Not that I remember. Mm. The instruction I didn't have much problem with. It was lab work. I think but you, I, think, I did all right because of those two. Yeah. And I think you and I were taking chemistry about the same time. I was taking it in high school and you were taking it in college. Really? Mm hmm. It would have been 67. Probably. Yeah. But it turned out, of course, it was better off that I stayed with the railroad than ever getting to be a pharmacist. But the only reason I wanted to be a pharmacist, I was tired of working at night. Well, uh, and that was your only choice with the railroad? Uh, they wouldn't let you work in the daytime? Mm -hmm. 
seniority. Okay. The bad thing was about it, it was horrible for him, you know, have those hours. The good thing for us was that he got to go to all of our games and stuff in the afternoon, you know, when we were kids. Did you get enough sleep during those years, Bill? Not, not always. Yeah. Sometimes I had to get up and go outside and kick the kids off the driveway that was shooting goals mm -hmm. and making noise. And throwing yeah. balls against the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I said, guys, I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you were, why did you say that it was better that you stayed with the railroad? Well, because of the uh, benefits that I derived by going to Chicago. Okay. Because then you got to retire early and all that. Well, I didn't, uh, well, I retired at an early age, but I had 39 years service. Yeah. And uh, besides that, going to Chicago and getting the chance to be a rules examiner added an additional amount of money to my pension that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Okay. Mm -hmm. Quite a bit more, I guess, huh? Well, yeah. seven hundred and well, eight hundred dollars a month. A month, yeah. And so you don't get Social Security as such; you get railroad retirement. And uh, he doesn't get Medicare either. He gets. You get the what the railroad met, uh, insurance provides. Well, how does actually, that compare? You think? I've got Humana, which is actually uh, Medicare for. For railroad people? Yeah. Uh, it's, but it's paid for by the railroad, right, Dad? Uh, it's part of your pension. Yeah. I, they, they withdraw the uh, premiums out of my bank account. The insurance company does. Mm -hmm. But then the railroad turns around and reimburses me. So theoretically... Well, let me back up a minute. Every year, the railroad gives us $2,500 a piece in our health program. And so anytime we go to a doctor or have premiums, they reimburse us out of that fund. And if I use up all of mine, I can still use hers, or vice versa. So, for instance, I, I bought hearing aids that was $4,000. The company paid for them out of that fund. Well, what if you use so much that you use Vera's and you use, are you talking about Vera? Mm -hmm. And you use yours, then what? I don't know after that. You have to wait a year, okay. or, you know, until the first of the next year. But that's year. never happened. No, not yet. Right now, I'm down to about $2,300 in that total fund. Mm -hmm. But if I don't use that up before the end of the year, 1st of January, they give me another uh, $5,000. What happens if you have a catastrophic illness, like cancer? Uh, insurance will take care of it. Okay, so you have catastrophic insurance. Okay, through that. So he's got all that, and basically the the cost of his policy is being paid for by the railroad. I, I am real surprised that the railroad can cover all, all those pensions of everyone. Well, yeah. Because weird. The railroad's kind of, you know, petered out as far as I'm concerned, but maybe no, not. Still around. Is it well, still? Santa Fe and the Burlington yeah. merged. Well, that's true. And they're still running 100 car trains. Okay, so I guess I'm wrong. Okay. Yeah. And it's cheaper to, these days in a lot of ways. We use way less fuel to move way more cargo. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> so you have any more questions, Ian? I don't so. Well, some of what I said may not be exactly true. Because that's been 70 years ago. Well, this is what a memoir is, you know, it, a mm -hmm. memoir, if you would write one, would be, you know, your memories to the best of your, your, your history to the best of your memory. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
It's hard to remember a lot of things that took place that long ago. You did a good job. Mm -hmm. It's just like I couldn't remember a lot of things that when I was overseas, how long from here to here to here to here. But uh, like I told Jack, it seemed like that Tinny and it experience was only just a few days but mm -hmm. turned out we found out it was nine days wasn't it mm -hmm. because it was so simple seemed so simple but uh, it was an interesting experience for a young guy do you think you uh, mature matured a lot during those two years or however long it was Three years oh sure yeah was. yeah because like I said a lot of the young guys that went in just joined, we'll say, couldn't handle boot camp. They couldn't handle being called this and called that, you know, and it didn't bother me. Why do you think it didn't bother you? Because I didn't pay that much attention to it. Yeah. I just did whatever they told me. I did almost get arrested one time in boot camp. <laughs> that was sort of funny. Uh, of course, San Diego boot camp is right down on the ocean, and right across the bay is the Navy boot camp. And uh, I can't remember now exactly what, but I think one of the guys that I knew had gone down across the beach, and they had it fenced, of course and had left and gone down there with the intention, I think, of trying to get over the fence and run off. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about it, and I decided to go down and try to stop him. And I got down almost to him, and I looked up and there was a jeep coming down behind me with a red light flashing. The MPs were after both of us. Because mm, they thought you were both going away. <laughs> they thought both of us was trying to go away. Mm -hmm. And I explained to them what was going on and everything was all right. But mm -hmm. That sort of bothered me, but other than that, it didn't bother me. Oh, I also uh, forgot to tell you when I was in high school, I played in the band. What did you play? Played trumpet. You, can you still play a trumpet? Oh, I, I doubt it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can watch these guys playing one and sort of tell what notes, you know, they're playing. But Were you pretty good? I guess. Did you march? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The only thing was we couldn't afford to have uniforms. Oh, really? And I remember we marched in a parade at Parrot one time. All the bands from out around the countryside were there. Mm -hmm. They had their uniforms. Mm -hmm. The only thing we could wear was just a white shirt and yeah. trousers, you know, and uh -huh. we felt like, well, we were sort of embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Well, then eventually the, I don't know whether it was parents, school, what, eventually got uniforms. Mm -hmm. But I never will forget how embarrassed we were to not be able to have a uniform. Mm -hmm. And that was what year, you think? Well, that was probably in 41. Okay. But I played in the band. Well, I guess I started playing in 1939 anyway, after we moved to Booker. Why did you choose the trumpet? I don't know. really don't. Was it the school's instrument or was it yours? It was mine, mm -hmm. but I don't know why I chose that particular instrument. Is that the only musical instrument you, you know how to play, or you, you ever known how to play? Well, I play the organ at home. Oh, that's true. I remember that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you learn to do that? You taught yourself? Well, uh, of course, the notes for a trumpet on music would be the same as a piano or an organ. So I knew, my mother was a music teacher at one time. Mm. And uh, I took lessons, of course, when I was just very small, probably eight or nine. Piano? Piano lessons. So your mom taught piano? 
Mm-hmm. Was she a pretty good piano player? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh... She played the organ, too, right? Yeah. yeah. In church? Yeah. Uh, but I can play the organ at home. The only thing is, my organ has to have the capability of playing what we call one finger bass notes. Oh. And that simply says that on the music that I look at, it has the treble clef and the bass clef, mm -hmm. which is the bass notes. And, the, mm -hmm. and up above that, it'll have guitar chords. Mm -hmm. So if I see an F chord up here on a organ, mm -hmm. I can hit the F note on, I mean on the music, I can hit the F chord on the organ mm -hmm. and it will play it just nice. like I was playing the complete chord with my, mm -hmm. all my fingers. Nice. So I can play one finger chord here and play the melody here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy playing that. What made you decide to try to play the organ? I don't know. Uh -huh. We were in Clovis at the time, and... Uh, and you were retired? No, okay. that was before. Now, I don't know why I decided to buy an organ, but <laughs> I did. <laughs> but I learned to play, and so I played for my own amusement. Mm -hmm. And you were 55 when you retired, I think, right? No, uh, let me think. 81... 56. Yeah. But I had 39 years of service. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. See, I was 17 when I started. That'd be right, wouldn't it? 39 be 56. Mm -hmm. So, is there anything you wish that you had done that you didn't do in your life? Mm -hmm. Not that I can think of. Oh, I could say I wish I'd have been a millionaire and all that, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I can't say I haven't had a pretty decent life. Mm-hmm. What are we going to do dinner here on Sunday? Is that the plan? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks, Dad. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> Good to hear it. Well... <laughs> I hope it helps you some. Yeah, you talked 77 and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you tired? <sighs> I'm surprised I haven't got a horse. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Ian. Um, yeah, Courtney will come on. Sunday. Good. Yeah, good. Um,